The Graphic Histories Podcast. I got bit by a radioactive bug. I tried experimental drugs. Went up for a stroll on a gamma testing range. I found an enchanted urucane. I made a serum that made me small. I modified the serum so it would make I me call. I got radioactive isotope in my Hey there, and welcome to the Graphic Histories Podcast. My name is Andre Mayette, your podcast host. Big thanks to Ugo the Mock for our theme song, Superpowers. And big thanks to you, gentle listener, for tuning in once again to another action-packed, fun-filled show. Today I talk with Johnny Christmas. Really cool character. Uh, he's done some really cool work. I worked with Margaret Atwood. Um, worked with uh, Wade Gibson. Worked with a lot of big names. And, uh, you know, definitely a super talented, uh, very cool guy. He's in the the, uh, the young adult sphere now with some of his new graphic novels, and he's certainly excelling at that. And, uh, yeah, it's a great conversation, a great chat. And I'm glad I could finally bring it to you. You know, he's a busy dude, uh, so I had to kind of schedule far out from when I get a chance to talk to him. And it worked out that we finally got uh, to sit down and do the chat, and uh, it was a blast. It was really fun, and I feel like we got into some some fun places with Johnny about his story and uh, and the way he approaches life, and a uh, great conversation. Really, really good. So, Halloween is coming, and as such, I began watching some horror movies. And uh, I just uh, saw that Terrifier 3 was coming out, and it was playing in my local theater. Now, my local theater in Truro usually only plays the big movies, like the big, big movies. Sometimes it does other stuff, but not always. And for the sake of, uh, you know, the, the the season, I see the Terrifier 3 was coming to the theater. So I decided to check out 1 and 2. Now, I've never seen them before. They've, uh, you know, as a horror buff, it's always kind of been a bit of a blind spot. I know people that love them do, in fact, really love them. So I thought, well, let me get on it and see what all the, the hype's about. So uh, I watched the first one, and <laughs> I just finished watching the second one. And uh, they're insane, but uh, great. I mean, obviously, over the top, they're they're really gory, and that's that's part of their appeal, I guess, if people like the genre. But uh, it kind of reminds me a lot of like the Phantasm films. Like, there's this weird world they're building, and uh, yeah, it's engaging enough to help you stick around. So, if you're okay with the gore stuff, like it's it's ridiculous in some points. The first one really feels like I said, like a Michael Haneke film, <laughs> in that uh, you know. While watching it, there's not a lot of hope. Uh, it feels like Funny Games specifically, which is a movie that, that doesn't have a lot of hope in it, and that's kind of the point. But, uh, yeah, as they go along, they're, they're very interesting. There's a lot going on there, and I'm uh, pretty excited to see what they're going to do next. So I'm going to go see three soon and uh, see what all that's about. But, uh, you know, if you're into that sort of cinema, uh, check them out. But, uh, you know, it's not not for the squeamish, for sure. <laughs> it's funny, because, like, there's, there's this weird level of, like, new horror that, like, I don't know. It's like I could watch the uh, Text Chains of Massacre, which has you know a lot of gore, a lot of blood in it. But uh, they go over a little over the top in this one, and sometimes it's hard to look at it. But in a way, it's kind of like a weird experiment in that you kind of you got to force yourself to watch. And uh, yeah, it's fun. It's fun. All right. Well, Halloween is coming, so I hope you are uh, you're enjoying all the Halloween hijinks and uh, watch some horror movies. And I hope you enjoy this conversation. So here it is, my chat with Johnny Christmas. Uh, awesome. So you're in Vancouver, is that correct? I am. I am. Ah, nice and sunny there, yes. looks like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not likely. You're in Montreal? Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia. That's right. That's right. The, That's the, right. Um, the uh, Federation of Podcasts, yeah. Oh, right, yeah. Complete opposite yeah. side of the... Uh, well, they're they're, uh, they're kind of scattered. A bunch of them are in Toronto. Uh, some of them are around here. Um, so like a lot of people involved with that are kind of scattered around. But uh, me personally, okay. yeah, Nova Scotia. So um, uh, Vancouver's a nice spot. I, I was there about a year ago now, actually. Me and my wife went there to visit some relative, uh, relative and kind of see the area we hadn't been before. So uh, right it, it was a blast. I really enjoyed the city. It's a, it's a, a vibrant city. There's always something going on. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful place. How long have you lived there? Uh, 15 years now. Oh, shit. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're, uh, yeah. you're, you're, you're definitely a resident now. That's for sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. Just got my citizenship and everything. So oh, excellent. I'm fully, fully locked in. Really? Where so I shall be, yeah. Where are you from originally? Where were you born? I'm I'm from uh the States. Mm-hmm. I grew up in Miami, born in Puerto Rico, but grew up in Miami and then uh then uh, came to Canada fifteen years ago and yeah, just been liking it ever since and you know, I live in New York and you know, all these other places, but but Vancouver was kind of the the place that kind of felt it had like kind of the same sort of city speed as Miami, kind of where I grew up. But really, but yeah, it's kind of the that's interesting. Um, yeah, Miami's bigger population, but it's very spread out. So mm-hmm. where you are is kind of so it's like a city of little cities. Mm-hmm. And uh, Vancouver, it kind of had the same thing. We've got like Vancouver, the you know main Vancouver, but we've got Richmond, Surrey, you know Delta, mm-hmm. which are all very distinct. Mm-hmm. So Vancouver itself feels around the same size as like the, the Miami that I grew up in. Nice. The same sort of city speed kind of thing, you know. So what did uh, what did yeah. your folks do in Miami? Uh, my dad was construction. He did a uh, plastering and lathing. And my mom, uh, she did uh, anything from like nurse's aid to she do some domestic work. But she kind of bopped around. At one point, she worked at a museum as, as kind of a, like a do- like, a you know, a museum guard. Oh, cool. So, so she, yeah, so she she bopped around and did uh, various things. Did that sort of instill in you at a younger age, like sort of appreciation for art, getting to go kind of see that that space? Or was that a, a different no. story altogether? <laughs> no, but it, it did give us something in common because I was mm-hmm. already doing the, uh, I was already, I already had an interest in art, but it was nice that my mom was like, now my mom was like, oh, cool. Like now all of a sudden she had favorite artists. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, actually uh, that might have inspired that might have helped push along my my love of fine art actually because I was loving comics and I was loving yeah. like video games and and like um pop culture art but she would come home with like a t-shirt from with um a t-shirt with uh Monet or something yeah. and and I started to like kind of really appreciate that stuff on a different level different level mostly mm. probably because of the conversations that she and I could have yeah, that's cool. Well, that's it's funny because yeah. it's not often that you get to talk to someone involved with comics or graphic art in general. And I mean, I know the appreciation is there because if you're an artist, you have to appreciate sort of all of the aspects of it, including the fine art side. But it's rare mm-hmm. you hear many comic artists really talk about, you know, an early love of that sort of stuff or or influencing them a lot. So it's it's uh, yeah, which is weird. I've noticed that too. Yeah, like I know. My, yeah, a lot of my uh, comic book friends they'll talk about Kirby and um, Neil yeah. Adams, which fantastic you know but it doesn't really go beyond that which I, I find interesting i think mostly because a lot of cartoonists are self-taught we're all kind of reinventing the wheel mm. so um so even when we do arrive at say an art school if we go to formal training we're already kind of we've already done our own research and our own um uh deep dive into mm. mignola or, or you know whatever we're into yeah. so we might get a little bit of like uh rothko or something but we're still you know i still on the prize of of trying to be more like you know uh, you know one of the cartoonists that we admire you know yeah. charles it, burns or something yeah oh that's a great one um yeah. Dan- daniel close is one i often fall back to when oh, I'm looking at like the it's funny yeah. because i always find and maybe you'll find this too i'd like to get back to obviously when you fell in love with the comics and stuff but i also find that um it seems like people tend to love the style that isn't theirs. You know, like like if you watch somebody, like you watch yeah. somebody's art style and you're like, man, like I love like Daniel Klaus. My art looks nothing like him or like yeah. Steve Dillon or one of these guys that have like a very yeah. simple but outsider kind of style. And, yeah. uh, you know, Paul Galusi, or, or I'm probably not pronouncing his name right, but the English uh, guy. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, like, I love that stuff, but it's so far from my art. It's just, uh, and maybe the the love of fine art kind of fits into that, too, that it's like an appreciation for what it is, but also that it's yeah. something that you can't do, you know, or it's beyond. Yeah, and that is interesting. I always get that when people ask, well, what are my influences? And I say, uh, Tomo, Mignola. Nice. And um, I forgot who else. Um, Jaime Hernandez, and they're like, no. it doesn't look like your art doesn't look like like any of that. And I'm like, yeah, no, it, but it influences on a different level. It's not mm. like a, it's not like oh, that's great. I, I'm influenced to draw like that. It's mm. almost like I'm influenced to feel what they make me feel. Mm. Um, and that's the influence. But yeah, that's really that's really funny. That's a great observation. Where sometimes it's not a one to one. It's it, it yeah. just gets. It's like a hot dog or something. Like you take all the stuff and <laughs> yeah. you put it into the grinder and then yeah. out comes this other thing that is totally unrecognizable. Yeah. But kind of tastes a little bit the same, maybe a little bit, yeah. but doesn't look the same. 
Well, it's, it's strange that people equate that if you're influenced by someone, you have to look the same as them. Like, that's true. Like, yeah. it's like, if you say, well, you know, like Humberto Ramos or someone like that, like really inspired me, mm -hmm. but your stuff is, is a lot more, a lot less uh, bombastic Then it's like, well, then, you know, it has to look the same, exactly the same. So yeah, uh, you see it, I guess sometimes, but it's, it's weird. Cause there's, you're right. Like it's an emotional feel. Sometimes it's just totally. Like the 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 camera angles, if you will, in quotes that you pick when looking at sure. certain things, like the way you form the the panel. Yeah, um, and, I, and I figure like if we've got one Umberto Ramos in the world, yeah. we don't need two. Like I mean that <laughs> he's got it cornered and he's doing it very well. So there's you know, <laughs> yeah. you it's a very good way to look at it. Do. Yeah, we got it. We got we got Umberto already. We don't need. Yeah, that's that's exactly. a really good way. That's funny. Uh, well, what got you into comics? Like, what was the first? Do you remember what the first comic? Uh, uh, uh the first i i would say i remember my the first thing that really got my attention was a flash comic that my dad brought home from like the 7-eleven and it was um i think i went out and hunted down and i actually like found it i think uh i forget who was who was the art on it but i think it was a flash in a graveyard holding like this kid and he was, there was a tombstone behind him and i was thinking like oh this is so cool it was very moody um and it got my attention. It didn't it didn't make me really want to be a cartoonist, but I thought, oh, this is something. Hmm. And I want to keep reading these. I don't want to I want to dig in. But the the first that made me want to be a cartoonist was that whole image explosion, like hmm. Jim Lee's art um on on the X-Men uh, Uncanny was was like mind blowing to me. Cause that was I often thought of, you know, a lot of comics had it and still do, not so much anymore, but house styles, you know. Hmm. You crack open a Archie's Digest or a, or a, um, a Batman comic or something where you had artists like you know Jim Apero, who was great. Like there's mm -hmm. no knock on people who had like kind of a um, a house styles kind of type of yeah. thing because they were incredible artists. But it yeah. was very much like, oh, cool, this is Batman, this is Batman, this is this, this is that. But when I saw Jim Lee's art, it wasn't just like, oh, this is X Men. This was like, oh, this is Jim Lee. Mm -hmm. So who is Jim Lee? You know. So now uh, oh. now I I started to see that you can bring who you are to this instead of um bringing bringing your mastery to it is one mm -hmm. thing but bringing your personality to it was a whole other thing and um and I always knew that I my art would be more um I wasn't I wasn't as interested in like flash mm -hmm. as I was storytelling mm -hmm. um so when I saw and Jim Lee is very flashy, but it was very, it was very indi individual. You know, Will Sportas is very individual. Tom McFarlane is very individual. So when I would see these people who had a very individual style, their individual voice, even if it came across flashy, it was, it was a voice that spoke to me more than anything else. Mm. And that, and at that point, I knew because I was, I was teetering between filmmaker or, or a cartoonist. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I saw what they were doing and able to create these incredible worlds without having to wrangle up 15 million dollars to tell the story <laughs> you just need a paper yeah. pencil and you know willpower and and some imagination and all of a sudden that that you know 300 million dollar epic can be told you know from the comfort of your living room it's a very practical so, um, way to approach it even as a child you know <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah i know I, yeah <laughs> i was a i was a broke kid you know so yeah. i had to figure out some kind of way and i knew i wanted to tell these stories and I didn't I didn't know how people did it because I just I grew up in you know this is my, my folks were immigrants and I grew up mm -hmm. in this neighborhood in Miami and I, I didn't know how it worked but I knew that I could do it if nice. I could just uh you know I didn't need a gatekeeper all I needed was a pencil that's so awesome that was that that turned the key for me that's very cool I like the the concept of the um you know finding the distinction it's almost like just seeing people that are doing something different uh hmm. you know the house style thing i know it's easy to to say but uh, it's sort of to me anyway a product of like you needed to you know in order to survive yeah. in that world at that time you needed absolutely. to fit in your superman comic had to look the same as everybody else's to keep it consistent um, absolutely yeah and i and i always i always uh, use the example of coca-cola like if hmm. you're trying to uh, the companies at large right like you want to to promote a level of uh, quality consistency quality branding quality you want to you want to keep that consistent so that if you find a can of Coke and you happen to be wandering through Botswana somewhere and you see the you see the the label, just like the logo type of Batman, you're like, OK, I identify that as Coke. And then you open it up and you drink it and you're like, oh, whether I be in Botswana or Scotland, this product tastes the same. You know, it makes sense company wide. So yeah. it behooves a company that's on the rise 
to to maybe ask the freelancers to keep it consistent mm -hmm. so that uh, a reader at all times will know that a Batman story has, you know, this many beats. It'll look this kind of way. It, you know, so I, I totally understand that from a business point of view and from an artistic point of view, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, um, the pride of craftsmanship of making a chair that looks like this is what that chair looks like. Yeah. Instead of like making, you know, you have a dinner table set where all the chairs look different, you know? Yeah. That, that might be more my style, yeah, but I could yeah. totally understand the, uh, the, um, the, the call to, um, consistency and excellency that make mm. you make the entire, entire dinner set look the same, you know, yeah. that that's an art form in and of itself. Yeah. And comics is so beautiful in that way that, um, you know, there's a real alchemy between the art and the writing, assuming that they're different, two different mm. people. Um, yeah. you know, and, and that one, Jim Lee sort of that, that X-Men really, really took off in a, in a crazy way. I remember my first experience with it was uh, pizza. Oddly enough, there was like, I think it was like Greco or one of those companies in, in Canada here had some kind of a deal where they were giving away X-Men comics with a pizza when you bought a pizza from the thing. And it was Jim Lee's art. And it was like, everything was Jim Lee's art over the advertising. And as a kid, you know, I, I wasn't a, a rich kid either. Um, but, you know, you get the comics you can when you get them. And, and uh, those ones were just so crazily bombastic and, Obviously, such a big influence on the X Men cartoon from around the same time period, and it's just oh, so, yeah. like, you know, just so iconic. And uh, and it also, you're right, it kind of made it like, it it made comics seem a bit more uh, like film. Um, just they they had a mm. real more realistic look, and uh, yeah, no, super cool. That's that's very and very exciting. It was a very yeah. exciting time. Like uh, like uh, I'll say the, the the one thing that all those guys had in common was that they were exciting. Like mm. Rob. Rob Liefeld's art is exciting to look at when you're mm -hmm. like a four, 14 year old boy. That's just oh. like, what? This is insane. <laughs> you know, or, uh, you know, Eric Larson or, or, you know, all of them, you know, they had that one thing in common, which was, yeah. which was really cool. Wow. You won twice, man. You got pizza and a yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. comic. Yeah. 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 It's probably my grandmother spoiling me. It's probably what it was, but, uh, <laughs> that's really funny. Um, wow. So, um, what prompted you to want to get into doing them as the time went on? Like, where did, where did you start making them? Was it as a kid, you're making your own, doing that sort of thing? Yeah. So uh, I remember uh, this friend of mine who was also into uh, comics as well, X-Men comics. I think he was one who actually handed um, handed me that, like, when we were first trading comics or whatever. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Troy. Um, uh, uh, everybody and, needs and a Troy in their childhood. Everybody you know, needs yeah, a Troy. Yeah, yeah for sure. So, so we started making these. Uh, so what? I started creating comic characters, and he started creating comic characters, and then we started trying to kill each other's comic characters. Like I'd show him some. Well, I think he started it. Like I, I would show him, like, "Oh, cool, check out these, you know, characters." And he was like, "Oh yeah, cool." Then he'd come back the next day with my characters drawn, with his characters coming in, like killing all my characters. <laughs> I was like, "What?" So I try and kill all of his characters, and then the next thing I knew, like these, these like kind of one sheet comics were like floating around the school, and people were like, mm -hmm. "Hey, when's the next adventure of?" this and that and um <laughs> so that was my first taste of um of you know having an audience mm. <laughs> seeing what what appeals what people comment on what they don't comment on building our craft building um uh storytelling that that um that continues and also where monkey wrenches are being thrown every time because mm. I would I would plan this epic arc and then it'd all be gone. I remember once I had these creatures that were these like um reptile like creatures and they were called the creatures of the night. I had a salamander character, I had like a lizard character, I had a frog character, I had all this stuff going. Nice. And I showed it to him. And then the next day he came back and he and he just had like a giant foot. And he was like <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, and he was like, Oh, you didn't you didn't have any backgrounds in there, so there's no scale. So I just I just assumed that they were actually the size of a wow. lizard or frog, uh, I... you know, so uh, as, a, cool. as a kid who was probably uh, who was bullied uh i like not saying this is a bullying situation but like <laughs> the idea that like even the I, I like even at a young age as an artistic kid you still find a way to be hyper competitive with some other artistic <laughs> kid you know like you still right, it's yeah. not about sports anymore it's about my character yeah. can beat out your character you know so, it's, it's so ridiculous that's awesome i love that I, I, had, I had so many dreams and plans for those characters and then they were gone <laughs> <laughs> I could never use them again because he killed never. them. They're all gone. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. They're gone. But I, learned, I learned the importance of putting backgrounds in at mm. that point. <laughs> and also like story. I, I love that like even at a young age, like instilled in you the uh 
the concept because you know in comics i mean in mainstream comics death is sort of a revolving door so in your comics like yeah. once they're gone they're gone, they're gone I, gotta, yeah. I gotta find someone new that can survive and move on that's that's the goal. absolutely or you're gonna have some very creative way to bring them back, you know. Yeah, that's um, true. Can't bury them all in the pet cemetery or something. But... <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. So, did you pursue going like? Because you went to art, right? You went to uh, an art school. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I went to art high school, and that um, that's when I really fell in love with comics. Uh, so they had a specific then... art high school in Miami you could go to. Yeah, yeah, there was a. I don't know if it's still there, but uh, South Miami Senior High School had a magnet program called uh, Center for Media Arts, where we had four specialties. You could uh, specialize in photography, TV production, computer graphics, or commercial art. Wow. And I started off, uh, at that point, I was having some rebellion against comics. Like in middle school, I was like, I don't want to do this stuff anymore. I want to do something else. But I, but the the die was already cast, and I was already sent to this art high school before mm-hmm. I... I can um, get out of it. So, so I assume year, but, your parents were cool with you pursuing a career in the arts that they were letting you go to this high school. Yeah, it was, you know, it was odd. It was, it was my mom's urging. I think, uh, I think my mom was just glad that I was like my, my area of Miami. It's interesting in hindsight. And even at the time people would say it was tough, but mm-hmm. I, I, you know, when, where wherever you are, you just kind of is where you are, right? Yeah. I didn't I didn't feel like it was particularly like I never really had any issues. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, so I think I think my mom was just glad that I was not uh, in a gang or something. Like you know what I mean? Like I was just like a kid who was home drawing. Like you kind of knew where I was, yeah. like, all the time. And I I was um and it didn't even occur to me to get into anything like crazy. And I don't think I would have been um recruited anyway what are we gonna gonna do with this guy you know the the jets um, or the sharks were coming for you you know like yeah no hand you a switch blade and put you in the life right last pick for the street gang so that's right i I think my my mom was uh was happy that i had uh because i was i was going to the uh like the gifted program Mm. uh for academics and then then i think she just kind of wanted to keep me in some sort of specialized schooling thing I, i don't know i don't know she never gave me her full reasoning but uh i ended up at uh center for media arts so i did the first year in photography because i was rebelling and the second year in uh tv production and that's kind of where i was teetering between tv and yeah. um tv film or comics yeah and uh that's when i discovered like that's when comics really took hold of me and then the last two years i did a uh commercial art and then from there i went to uh my first two years of art school were in miami mm-hmm. at the new world school of the arts we had a local uh uh art school and then after that, um, I started really loving painting. And then I went to the uh, the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, wow. and that and that was that was that really opened up the world for me. Uh, going to to New York City and and kind of getting to see, uh, you know, when you're when you're living in a place now is a little bit different because of the internet. But when I went to art school, we like we had the internet, but it wasn't like it is now we didn't have social media yeah so so you had um so you knew like the best kid in your school at whatever it is that you were doing or maybe even the best kid in town but you didn't know what where exactly the line was and if you wanted to be a professional at least i thought i needed to find out what the line where the line was like what what is a good artist i know what a good artist is here at south miami senior high or at new world school of the arts but what about nationwide so at that point, I just I, I knew I had to get to New York City to see, like what what are the what are the the kids who are you know the best in the the nation? What are they doing? You know, mm. not even the nation. Like some of the the best kids in Tokyo. You know, they're they're coming here. Like so, so so you can kind of get a real um, taste of what how far behind you are, you know, or or where you need to improve or. Or what best practices others are, are implementing? Imp- uh, implementing? Did you so, always so proud? Was... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. No. no, 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 no. I was gonna say, did you always approach art in kind of a competitive nature like that? Or is that something that not com? It wasn't even competitive. It was just kind of um for growth, like education. It, it, yeah, I was just okay. ignorant. You know, yeah. I didn't. I didn't, oh, okay. I didn't even know what I didn't know. Right. So, yeah. like, I, I didn't know if I um because at every stage I would. I would get to another grade level and you find this kid who's doing oh, yeah, yeah. just making crazy art out of like uh seeds that he found on the way to school, you know? And <laughs> wow. I didn't know that was a possibility until yeah. I got to ninth grade and I'm like, Oh, cool. 
then you get to 10th grade and some kids doing something else. So, so, uh, and that was just in my high school. So like, mm-hmm. if, if I, I figure, well, if I go to a place where folks are really experimenting, maybe I could really figure, figure this thing out. Cause I know I wanted to be a, an artist professionally. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to see, um, I wanted to find a line between self-expression and um, commercial utility and, mm-hmm. and comics and illustration already kind of had a little bit of that, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I just needed to, I just needed to increase my, my knowledge because, mm-hmm. uh, because yeah, the, the competitive thing, I, I always uh, say that, especially in the creative arts professionally, the, the, the longer you're at it, the more you just become more of yourself. Yeah. So it's it's almost like you're not even competing with anyone. You're just kind of discovering what it is that there's this well that you're digging mm. and you're finding more and more stuff in it. Kind of mm-hmm. like uh, Mr. Ramos again, Umberto. Yeah. Like he's becoming more like so you can you could take the route where you try to be Umberto Ramos. Yeah. And but that's you're not gonna your your growth is gonna be capped at whatever he's displaying. And whatever yes. he's displaying is kind of like um it's like a, when a new product comes to market. The R and D department is still is still five ten years ahead of what you see right now. Yeah. So what Mr. Ramos is cooking up right now is five years late. So when you mm-hmm. chase him, he's going to probably drop something next week that he's been cooking up for years, right? Mm-hmm. Like a whole new expression. But when it, when you're digging your own well and figuring out how deep your own well goes, you're you're always you're always ahead. You have a competitive advantage yeah. because it's only you. Um, sourcing the only you with the only references and um, influences that you bring to bear. So I just, so art school for me was just learning how to think more than uh, how to, to be, be an artist. Like how are the people approaching this, this crazy um, way of living? I like that allegory. It's kind of like, you know, like digging a hole. It's like, you know, seeing the Humberto Ramos work might pull up a rock that gets you a little further, right. You know, like it's just something that you can pull out of the way. Um, yeah. Well, if you would have been towards like comic art, was this wait, like uh, I'm not sure how old you are, but was this around the time when like comic art was, I guess, more appreciated? I don't know how. Like, I've never been in that fine no. art school world, so I, yeah, I was wondering uh-huh. if it was if it was no. Uh, no? Okay, so we, it seems no, like it's okay now. now. Younger people yeah. seem like it's really taught. I guess maybe because it's now accepted that it is a commercially viable way to pursue a career. Like maybe at one point it wasn't considered that, but now mm-hmm. comics are its own thing and people see the success that can come from them. But uh, I, yeah. I wondered if you were there before that, that shift happened. Oh, I'm you. <laughs> way before. I remember, I remember sitting on the bus and hiding our comics as we were yeah. reading it, like, like uh, on the like public bus, because people mm-hmm. were like, well, what are you doing? And, uh, and then some folks <laughs> would condescend. I remember yeah. this one lady came over and she was like, oh, well, reading is reading. That's nice. Like, just like almost like, oh, oh. like verbally <laughs> patting me on the head. And I'm like, yeah, of course it's reading. Like, what do you think this is? Um, so, so yeah, so when, when the shift started to happen, when folks were like, wow, that's so cool that you're a cartoon. So I thought they were like, I thought they were like, you know, like mocking me. Or something. Yeah, 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 mocking me. I was like, oh, yeah, like, okay, whatever. And now it's like it's it's legit. Like uh, I I I still a part of me still refuses to say that it's cool, mm. <laughs> but it feels like people think it's cool. Um, but I yeah. you know I came through the the slaughterhouse where it's you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, like were the art school teachers even like respectful of oh, it? Or were they God. also very not so mm. much? No, no, uh, no. no. Uh, my in, my in frame South- of reference for art school is mostly the the movie Art School Confidential, <laughs> uh, which which very a friend accurate. a friend of mine who went to art school told me the same. He's a painter. He told me the same thing. He said like he said this is surprisingly accurate, man. He said like yeah, yeah. I love the idea because like it's such an artist thing. Like the the center point of that movie. I mean, there's a lot of center points to that movie. It's really, really great Uh movie. But the, like how tortured the guy is when he (laughs) thinks that he should be respected as this artist because he has such skill in his craft. And this guy who's painting a fucking car that's not even centered on the thing, you know, (laughs) that looks like a three-year-old drew it. Uh, And everybody loves him because he's like an outsider. And like, he doesn't know. It's like, he doesn't know anything about art, which he doesn't because he's like cop that's undercover. But it's, it's, it's just so like, it's, it's that, that pretension of art. Like I understand it, but I also understand how funny it is too. And there's like this real, like that movie mirrors it in such a wonderful way. Cause even as an artist trying to get into it, like you have this reference, but you also need to have some sort of a, a drive and uh you know it gets down to that level it's like because art you know in the end is subjective but you still 
you know, you have this drive in you to to be respected for your art and to, uh, yeah. to be overshadowed by someone that you do not respect is something <laughs> that I imagine is f happens a lot in the art world. So it's oh my goodness, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So uh, it was yeah. accurate, huh? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you could you could feel you could still feel the uh, you could feel it the heat coming off of clouds like like in the in the original mm. like one page comic and so, in the in the comic in the in the movie mm -hmm. it's it's almost like he still has like some <laughs> at least at the time of making it like that residual like uh, yeah. you know but, uh, yeah, i think a lot school. of i think a lot of seminal projects that artists do have a lot of fuck you in them like like oh, they, they oh were made because it was despite someone else right like oh fuck you gets gets a lot of people out of bed in the morning <laughs> yeah, and, yeah you know it it's a it's a drive to you know <laughs> especially early on yeah uh well i guess moving along uh your your sort of trajectory after you got out of school uh where were the first like what was the first project uh well the first project was a ways in i, I became a graphic designer so oh. i graduated art school yep. and um and i wanted to be an illustrator and it was not not um uh, the market was really, really tight. And I had a graphic design teacher and um, he was, uh, she was great, uh, Kathleen Creighton. And she says, hey, uh, if, you, uh, if you really don't hate graphic design or I hate, you know, just sitting in front of a computer all day, you can, um, you should just, you, you know, it's a good time for graphic design in New York City right now. Mm -hmm. So I did, I, I became a, I became a graphic designer and I did that for like 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then so that's um, what I do. So I'm very familiar with that world. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, was, I was print graphic design, more of an in-house guy. I, I wasn't like, um, I was, I was really good at getting it in on time and getting it, um, making it look good, but I wasn't like the far out creative, like mm. I wasn't going to do your ad campaign. I was going to do your magazine or your, yeah. um, your, your newspaper, which is like, I, I loved it actually. Yeah. Um, I, I oddly did too. Uh, you know, like, and still do, yeah. I, I still do it, but it's like, yeah, there's something oddly fulfilling about like framing something in a really nice way and, you know, doing that. Sort yeah. Of, I do a lot of stuff for social media and websites now, but it's like, uh, and video editing is something I've gotten into a lot lately, which I've really enjoyed as well. But uh, yeah, there's something really satisfying about having yeah. a job well done, you know, a nice totally. finished product. Yeah. It's like creative enough, but mm -hmm. it's also, um, it's it's useful in a certain way. Um, I even like the late night calls to the printer, like, hey, man, I'm sorry, man, we got we're getting this thing's coming in under the wire. All right, man, I got you. Yeah. You got it. You know, like I even like the camaraderie of kind of we're pushing mm. this thing. Um, but then uh, then my my comic career started. Uh, I think the first my first thing was I think I did some like covers for Devil's Do back oh, in nice. 2011 or something. Um, and then I did like a one shot for them. And then at that point, I just started starting, started trying to put together pitches. Mm -hmm. And I was living in Vancouver then uh, at, at that point, as I am still now, and just just sending stuff over. And I was starting to get some traction over at with some editorial at Dark Horse and traction here and traction there. Nothing was like happening, but like there was a sense of forward movement. And at the same time, I met um, Ed Brisson. Who, uh, yeah, yeah. First, first interview I've ever had on this show is Mr. Bristol. Oh, right on, yeah. yeah. Um, he lives here in so, uh, Nova Scotia. That's right, that's yeah. right. He, he he always tells us about the great um, property values and the, the beauty of the place. And when I went, I saw how beautiful the place was. He's one of the uh, the converts. Like when he came out here for some con, and then he was like, "Why am I spending so much money to live in Toronto? I'm going to move out here." Yeah, yeah. He's so, a true uh, believer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, he was doing a comic series called A Murder Book mm -hmm. and a short crime comics, like five, five pagers. And I was just kind of making my own things. I was I had my aspirations of going Jaime Hernandez style mm -hmm. in terms of like career, you know, just write and make my own stuff and slowly, slowly make an indie career for myself. But I, I really liked what I was doing. And I, and I says, hey, you're doing these five page comics. I why don't you kick me one of those scripts? I'll do five. I'll do one of these for you. Cause he was, you know, he would bring an artist, you know, he's always on the search for artists. Mm -hmm. um, but Ed was Ed uh, in his infinite wisdom says, Hey, instead of doing a, one of these crime comics, why don't we do a pitch for, uh, for something? And I thought there's no way, like, no, like I'm, I'm going to do my Jaime Hernandez. We're not going to, I'm not, not going to do that, whatever. But I, I thought, cool, whatever. Why not? Let's, mm -hmm. let's do it. Let's do one of these five page crime comics, but let's do a five page pitch. So we did a pitch 
sent it into uh sent it around town and we got some we got a bite at Skybound. And I think the editor was Tina Grace actually at the time when he was editing over there. And he he went back and forth with Ed quite a bit on this pitch. And um actually he uh Ed has Ed has ha- gone on to actually create that comic. I forget forget what he's called it now. I think it's called like the displaced, but at the time it was called something else. Mm-hmm. And um and I was so we were so encouraged that they were going back and forth with us. Like they didn't take it ultimately. Um, so I was correct that they didn't. That they were gonna <laughs> Sweet well, we were so Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> no job for you either. Yeah, that's right. It's um, like I'm right, but I'm poor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it was it was. I just didn't think they would respond, but they responded like back and forth for months. You know, nice. could you change this? Could you change that? And 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 instead of that being a downer, it was it was emboldening. It was like, mm-hmm. whoa, wow, holy shit! Let's let's do another one. So we sent in another one to image and that was sheltered that's what we became sheltered mm. and um and shelter was going to be a five issue mini series but our numbers were so good on issue number one that all of a sudden we were able to expand ultimately to 15 issues so i went from like a guy trying to get into the industry to do my like small indie stuff to a guy who was like uh on a full-time artist on a successful indie series that came out of nowhere that's you know good. so that was yeah, it was it was really crazy. Just like right out the right out the gate, it was a long road to the gate. But then mm. then then uh, then sheltered went. There was like a rumor. I think I think what I always downplay and say it, it's due to the rumor. I think it was because the idea was really good and people really took to it. Mm. But there was a rumor going around that it was a prequel to The Walking Dead. Oh <laughs> really? Yeah. I, think that, I think that couldn't have hurt. You know, our, our who started but, that rumor? Dean? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Hey, did you hear so, about uh, this pro- book? That yeah, the, yeah. yeah. yeah that, that's really funny. Well, hey man, whatever. Like, dude, the hey. the, the industry is so nuts. Whatever gets you in, ahead grab it and run oh, with it absolutely and and it was um and the response from readers after reading it was was um whatever whatever got them there once they were there they were like in they were like yeah. no we like this you know whatever we thought it was this this is this is really good so so yeah so that that was the that was the first theory that got me in in the gate and like in the biz it's awesome so eternally eternally grateful for for that and for uh for Ed for kind of uh pushing pushing for that. That's awesome. And uh so you rolled along onto was Catbird far after that, the Angel Catbird project with Yeah, it was uh so after after Sheltered, I was doing a sci fi series with Curtis Week, actually. Mm-hmm. And it was called it was called something else. But then there there was um it it ended really badly. Uh I think Curtis and I got like three issues out. Oh, and yeah. uh, it wasn't it wasn't bad between me and Curtis. Like me and Curtis were were always good, but there was there was like some behind the scenes stuff going on. Um, That's the part people don't talk about. Like, and I I don't need you to expand because I don't want to get you in any trouble with whatever whatever studio <laughs> oh, no, or whatever was involved with there. Nah, but the idea that like it like people don't get like people think it's as easy to make comics that you just go and you write a comic and you find an artist and you you draw the comic oh, and you all get to go live your lives and everything's great. And and much like the comparison we made earlier to the film industry, much like that, there's producers and editors and other people that have their own fingers in there. And, you know, you don't realize how complex and, and messed up it can get, you know, like it's pretty, it reminds me of this old movie, uh, you know, Christopher Guest, like Best in Show and all those oh, yeah. movies. Yeah. So one of his early yeah. movies was called... Um, Oh God, I'm forgetting the name of it, but Kevin Bacon was in it. And it, it was one of his few movies that is not a, uh, not a, a mockumentary comedy. It's like a straight up movie. Um, mm-hmm. And he plays like a film student that makes a really cool indie film that gets a lot of traction. And then he gets uh-huh. signed by a studio to make a big movie. And the movie he wants to make is a very Ingmar Bergman, black and white, takes place in like a, a cabin uh, during a snowstorm, like a ski chalet. And it's like a, a couple and another friend of the couple. And it's this really like heady indie film, you know, about relationships. And uh, and by the end, because like throughout the movie, he keeps making small concessions uh, and by the end of it, it's like it's a a teen sex comedy called uh, Beach Nuts, and it's like it's totally far <laughs> removed from what he wanted to do, and he kind of loses himself in the uh, in the the studio system. And I often think about that movie when it comes to like how far the core idea oh. goes to what gets made sometimes with some of these projects. 
Big time. Um, yeah, it was it was a it was a total disaster. Like it was it was really <laughs> really like truly truly. It was like one of the it was the worst time in my <laughs> professional creative life. Really, it was it was really bad. I thought I thought my time in I thought my time in that like kind of that area of comics were over. Like mm. it really and truly, really? it, it right. got like behind the scenes got really really bad. Mm. And um, so uh, but luckily I I had uh. The book that would become Firebug was already kind of I had a oh, space for it within um Brandon Graham's Island anthology. So I knew I was at least gonna get a few five like a few page comics out, but I thought, all right, I'm just I'm gonna go back to my dream of just like going, you know, small indie and hopefully that'll become a thing. But and then during that time, uh the uh the Angel Capper thing came along, like uh Margaret was friends with, or, or had known uh, an editor who it was this long story. Anyway, some of my samples arrived at, at, uh, with Margaret and she, she chose like my art. And all of a oh. sudden I went from like, okay, I guess I'm going to have to like go back to the warehouse and get a job to like, Oh shit, I'm working with Margaret Atwood. So it was this complete loop to loop. It went completely Completely like from the worst moment <laughs> in my my professional comics career to at that point like the best moment, wow. and um and that was that was really really cool working with Margaret and and seeing, um just a little bit of kind of working with her and seeing and how the process worked and, and her professionalism and her um her poise and the way she um interacted with interviewers and and readers mm-hmm. and um and how consistently like she was her like the same Margaret Atwood that you know on interviews is like the real Margaret Atwood. It wasn't like a, like at least the Margaret Atwood I know, you know, yeah. like, um, so that was really cool too. Like it was, um, yeah, it was, it was a really, really cool experience to just kind of like ride shotgun with Margaret for, for a few books and, and, and see, see what that experience is like from up close. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and then after that did um firebug and got, you know, finally got a writing credit on my own professionally so it was like right. okay great now i'm writing my own stuff and now it's time to build my little sandcastle mm-hmm. um nice. it's it's really great writing shotgun but you have to build your own thing if you're going to build your own yeah if that's what you're going to do that's your 100%. aspiration which it was um and then i got the uh the great fortune of adapting the william gibson um yeah i was gonna ask you about that um for, for, that was really cool. What was that project like? Because I actually listened to the audiobook version of that, I think, uh, initially oh, when they put that out a while ago. I think it was the Gibson script for the third one, I think. Okay. Um, I feel like they had Lance Henderson and someone. I think it was... Uh, in, oh, that uh, sounds familiar. Yeah, I think they did the Gibson script as an audiobook with Henderson and um, Michael Bean was in it again, too, I think. Uh, yes. Yeah. But uh, I remember listening to it, and I did. I did actually read read that uh, your your uh, your version of that, which is really cool. Like, how ah, was that you. daunting to you to like adapt something from Gibson, or or just in the Alien franchise in general? Because I mean, the fan base for that is, I wouldn't say they're insane, but they're certainly as insane as most nerddom fan bases go. Right? You know, not e- daunting. E- because... Even so much to turn on Ridley Scott when he makes a movie they don't like, like Prometheus. Yeah, right. Truly. Which I which I um, love, but I I you know who knows. Yeah, I thought it was cool too. I, I like that he went a different way on Prometheus. Yeah, I would have liked so, to no, see it, more of that. Let's just keep let, let him do yeah, that. You know? so anyway. Yeah, just like do a go from horror to make it a like he went sci fi instead of horror, you know, which is cool, you know, instead of sci fi horror, which was the first kind of deal, he went like sci fi, sci fi, you know, with yeah, all H horror, you know. I also yeah, love like that. Uh, well, even like it's it's so funny because I, I saw a meme which I thought was really hilarious to me. I often talk about fandom and how it's kind of toxic sometimes where like you know the the fans are like we want something different and you give them something di- mm. you know you're like we don't like this it's the same and then they, you give them something different like we don't like that it's too different and then it's right, like well yeah. here here's some garbled mess where we try to combine the two and make you happy and they're like we don't like that because you know it's inconsistent and weird and uh you yeah. know that was that was covenant which is like when the studio is like well let's just undo every but i like the like i saw one thing that made me laugh a lot it was like because that new romulus movie came out right which was enjoyable and um you know the, it uh, it's like ridley scott says like 
uh, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna kind of eschew the alien universe and and make a, a deeply philosophical commentary about how God <laughs> God returns and hates what He made and wants to kill us because we're a complete disappointment. And uh, and then the studio's like, hey, remember those little face huggers? Like, let's bring those back. People, <laughs> those are creepy. Let's just have a lot of those. So uh, yeah, I thought it was pretty clever, but yeah, like the idea of the, all of those deeply philosophical man seeking meaning and this kind mm -hmm. of cosmic horror idea that the universe doesn't care what we want or what we seek yeah. and you know and, and we're not going to get the answers we really want because they're impossible for us to reach it's, it's i don't know like that's way more interesting to me than just monsters killing people although i really do love Absolutely. the alien movies but hey yeah you know what are you gonna do yeah. but yeah so was that daunting to you no because i didn't have enough time like i didn't have i didn't have <laughs> like you know if if i had i was like kind of like you know on the monthly schedule so mm -hmm. i didn't have the time to Fret. Had they given me like a bunch of time, I would have, mm. I may have fretted because I, uh, I don't really have too much interest in franchises, like hardly at all. But I always mm. told myself, like, if the alien franchise ever comes up, you know, that's the one. So when it came up and it was like Gibson's, I was like, oh, shit, this is great. So if they would have given me a bunch of time, I probably would have really mm. freaked out. But, I, you know, <laughs> I had just the same amount of time to do it as like, you know, whatever monthly comics. So I had to like adapt and bust through this thing, like, you know, and, and, try, and try and get it just done so i didn't yeah. i didn't have the time uh, that i would have loved to have on it but that kind of probably saved saved me a little bit in terms of worry and stress yeah you really so, ran uh, the gamut I, there though of like of all the options of your art like you worked with a big yeah. art you know big writer and like that's a collaborative nature i'm not sure like collaborating with her must have been interesting because you know she's a, an author as well she's most well known for so which isn't very mm -hmm. much a collaborative thing you know you write your right. story and that's it so you get to do that then you get to do your own work and then all of a sudden you're adapting an existing work where i'm sure gibson yeah. had nothing to do with it because i think he died didn't he but uh no, no, he's alive oh is he okay yeah. never mind he's yeah. still around yeah we, yeah, we the, met for coffee actually. oh wow coffee okay so then back yeah, to that yeah. that's awesome yeah, yeah really he, cool guy was he deeply involved in that like did he no no what, what i i didn't want to like I knew people were coming to the people who would come to the project is coming for William Gibson. They're not coming mm -hmm. for me. So mm -hmm. I wanted to, to really serve the alien franchise. And I really wanted to serve Gibson's fans and like yeah. not mess up too much. So what we did was that we did kind of a little bit of a, um, I forget he did two, he did two drafts. And I, I think the first draft was probably more like uh, alien. And the second draft was more like aliens. Oh, okay. And I think, yeah, so I think we probably did probably more of the first draft with a touch of the second, if I'm not mistaken, or mm -hmm. vice versa, you know, something like that. Um, so everything I changed in the uh, in the script, um, not that I changed too much. I just try, like you know, you're breaking down a one a one statement, which is a script from start to finish to a mm -hmm. five issue thing. So there's certain things that you need to sweeten some areas for yeah. cliffhangers and so on and so forth. So. So there was like, sometimes I had shift a thing here or there, but not too much. And I would highlight everything that I changed and I would list the reason why. Mm -hmm. And I would send it to uh, to Mr. Gibson for his kind of, you know, what he would, what he thought on it. Um, was that required he, or is it just what you wanted to do? No, it was just, okay. just, I just, yeah, just. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to, you know, you, you, like it takes time to make creative work. And and even if it's like 30 years on, like it's it's kind of cool to know that someone's like, not just going to come in and just fuck yeah. around with shit just just because they can, right? Yes. Yeah. So he was, he was really gracious, and he was like, "Oh yeah, like I I see what because he he works in adaptation, like yeah. he's he's adapted films, he's written screenplays, so he knows that a thing can't be the thing that it like mm -hmm. it's a different thing when you you from a screenplay to a graphic novel it's going to be yeah. a different thing. You have to serve the medium. So so he was really great about like, oh yeah, I see why you did that, and yeah, great, you know. And I, cool. I think that that gave him a great bit of trust in like um. That I wasn't gonna monkey around with it just for whatever. And not that he like he didn't even have a, a foot in it. He wasn't like officially part of the project, yeah. you know. But I just wanted to, you know, that that he even like allowed us to like share it with them instead of him going like, leave me alone. I'm, I'm that was thirty years ago. Leave me alone. Like, <laughs> yeah, he, he, yeah. He, he, oh, he, you looked awesome. at it. Yeah, really, really, really cool guy. Like it's uh, super yeah, cool when like, you meet those people and realize they're cool people. Like it really is that's it's, part of the joy of doing this for me is like often when i meet people that do the things that i you know I, like yourself and other artists that i have on the show it's like you meet them and you're like oh they're just really cool people you know it's like yeah you know it's it's uh, disappointing when you get one that's a little uh 
you know, it, it it's rarely happened to me where you meet someone that's just a little hard to uh, to sort of engage with. But uh, yeah, but when someone's, I, open, I think that absolutely, yeah. And and what I found about uh, uh, Gibson and and Atwood both were that they were creative people who are interested and curious. Like mm. it, I, like I was like, I bet this is the same person that they were like when they were starting to create stuff. They were just interested and curious, you know. So it wasn't about some other thing it was about like if you said something interesting they would lean in and go what's that you know mm. um which was which is really inspiring because at the heart of the thing uh of the creative pursuit i think that's kind of it and to see that it you know at least with them that that's paramount um yeah. more so than whatever the trappings of other things that that uh the the externals you know yeah well, I think you Sensei nailed it. Stuff is still there. Yeah. I think it's a curious thing. I think it's staying curious. I think that's what keeps you as an, in, in, in general, I mean, it's probably just a good life rule beyond art, but uh, Absolutely. You know, staying curious in, in and not believing you have all the answers. I think that's when you kind of start to start to make your own little echo chamber and not get out of it. You know? That's when you do that. <laughs> that's right. So uh, well, that's very cool. That's atrophy, that's atrophy right there. Yeah, when you, start, no. you stop, you know. So. Yeah, that's cool. So then you went on to, of course, uh, doing your own books uh, and, and yeah. to, to yeah. quite quite a big so, success. Yeah, yeah. So I did a uh, Tartarus next. My 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 ode to sci fi, um, sci fi Greek mythology. Uh, wrote that over at uh, Image, art by uh, Jack T. Cole, and then later by Andrew Cronkey, who who's uh, since gone on to do uh, Bloodrick. Mm -hmm. Both incredible artists. And then, um, but meanwhile, this whole time, right back in 2015, I was trying to get into the kids space because mm. I, I like always want to do graphic novels for kids. Really? So, yeah, yeah. So like what? I started as sheltered was 2013, but by 2015, I was already trying to like, you know, and it, it took till 2022 before the first one came out. But I was very much trying that whole time to, to try and get something that's awesome. Made. Yeah. Because often it seems like, and I, this is not a commentary of the people that do them, that it's sort of like something people fall into. Um, I love yeah. hearing about the people that like strive and really wanted to to be in that space. Is that just because yeah. like you wanted to sort of touch like kids the way that you were touched by those sort of books when you were a kid or like in a way that. A, a little bit. Like I, I, I wanted to make something I thought would be cool, you mm -hmm. know, that I would think was cool. Mm -hmm. But mostly when I was a kid, Okay, so my whole life I've been making work for my my contemporaries. So mm -hmm. I was a kid trying to make comics that were cool and funny to kids, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there was this a kind of that door was already opened. So I always kind of knew I wanted to to do that. Cool. Um, and I don't my 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 larger mission is I want to make comics for from eight to eighty. Basically, I want to make stuff that's always, you know if one day if I'm making stuff that like just goes to nursing homes, that'd be awesome. You know, like I, I want to be able to, to, to speak to, to the, the human condition wherever we are, you know, yeah. and, um, and kids comics are, are really, really great in that you can't, there are, there are less shortcuts. Everything that you build has to be, uh, it's all um, character based. All the mm -hmm. solutions have to be character based. Whereas with adult stuff, which I love, and I, I, I hope to, um, my plan is to, to, to do, adult stuff as well as kid stuff yeah. yeah great um but to to go back to doing more adult stuff but also like um keep doing the stuff that i'm doing now in middle grade space but with adult stuff i can get out of almost any situation with a a hammer or a car chase you know <laughs> like there's a a fight scene or some crazy car chase or this and that where where with kids you can't do that so mm. everything to to get in or out of the situation creates a, a it requires a longer on-ramp or off-ramp, which requires better writing chops, mm -hmm. um, I find. I mean, you can kind of hack it if you want. Like, there's, any, there's a million ways to be a hack about certain things, but if you're oh, going to yeah. do it properly, like, you have to, you you can't deus ex machina your way out of it as, yeah. as much. I find that it, it makes me a better writer, actually, and a better communicator in terms of the craft. Uh, you can't hide behind RT, um you know, you know, oh, this is, you know, uh, this is yeah. some poetic, blah, blah, blah. Kids aren't going to get that nuance, right? So, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But you don't want to spoon feed either, right? So, no. you have to like learning where the line is, where it's not, you want to, you want to step back, just like half a step back. So the reader makes a leap themselves, yeah. you know, give them that much information, but not too much. Cause then they're like, yeah, yeah, I got it. I got it. I got it. You know, is what you want to read when you're reading. You're like, hey, awesome. I got it. But 
if that last little bit where you make that little leap, that's what you, what you want to do, which makes you a better communicator because you have to learn where the line is. Yeah. Um, uh, how much information do you seed before you get cloud burst, you know, and, yeah. and, and uh, start training? I love um, this. This is like a little, this is like a little class on how to write children's books. It's fantastic. <laughs> it makes yeah, perfect yeah, sense. Like I, the my favorite things that I watch that are kid that are kid centric. I guess, like for instance, like two examples come to mind. Are I just watched the the, the Wild Robot movie? Uh, oh man, I haven't seen it yet. Oh it man, good? it's beautiful. It's a beautiful movie, and it's like it has a really cav- like it sort of has this interesting concept about. Uh, the inherent violence of nature and that like, and also mm. the inherent uh, fragility of life. Uh, they, they do step over, like they do gloss over death quite a bit for a kid's movie, which I thought is quite interesting because there's some scenes where you're like, Oh, that that person's dead or this represents death. And like, oh, it's wow. just sort of, you know, and I, it, but it, it as a greater narrative, like it's kind of like, um, you know, inside out or something like I watched that. And mm. like, I can see why kids would like this, but has so much more than adults could, but you're also not really holding the hand, um, you're, you're sort of not treating kids. You're not talking really down to them. You're talking down to them on a level that you need to because they're children. But you're not mm-hmm. like, uh, you know, like babying them. I guess would be a better way to phrase it. Um, the other one would be I watched uh, for horror movies. I'm trying to watch as much for Halloween, and I watched uh, Monster House, which was the kids' movie from like the mid 2000s that Dan Harmon and uh, Rob Schraub wrote from uh, like the work on Rick and Morty and Community. Okay. And All I was, right. it's, it's a digitally animated movie. And I was like, you know, I've never seen it before. Someone mentioned it was one of their favorite movies they watched as a kid. And I said, well, I never saw it. I'll watch it. And uh, I really dug it. But it's like, it's it's like, you, if you wonder how like the writing team of Rick and Morty would write something for younger kids, but make it accessible and interesting. If they did a really good job. So it's like, you're right. It's treading this line where you're like, kids seem to enjoy it, but adults can too, because there's got to be yeah. some through line that it kind of appeals to all ages, you know, and you got to find that that perfect little spot. Exactly. What, what I found writing for kids is that they have the same kind of emotional, because you, you remember when you were a kid, when mm-hmm. someone did something you didn't like, you probably still don't like it now, you know, mm-hmm. like it's a, you, you had the same um, kind of emotional intelligence, you just mm-hmm. didn't have like all the information, you didn't have all the coping skills, like right. sometimes you get hungry, you, you, you didn't, you didn't know to go like, let me just, let me just wait, like you, you lash out or something, mm-hmm. you know, so it, so you could still speak to them in a way that all the emotional truth connects. You know, that's why something like Inside Out is so great. You know, it's all the emotional truisms. You sit there as an adult and you're probably weeping inside just as yeah. much as a kid would because it's it's true. It's just the truth, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then just trying to find language that will entertain and uh, invite. But but you can you can write the same thing, and it's just it's just a matter. Of, that's where a matter of of, of delivery delivery system you know that's why pixar movies are so great because they can yeah. be they can be for adults you know if you just if you put a bunch of swearing and whatever and it would be just an adult movie you just wouldn't even have noticed you know yeah that no. a kid's movie that's yeah. very true and like it, you're right it, it kind of grabs you at some weird heartstrings too like they definitely but you're right i mean really if you're just getting to the core emotion like human emotion of whatever it is like the wild robot for instance is very much about being a parent which i'm not but it could speak to me on a level that I understand about caring for something and, and going into being a parent when you know nothing about it and try, you know what I mean? And learning as you go along and, and, uh, and all these other things that uh, sort of kind of go along with all the rest of it. Like it can really reach you. And there's several moments like, you know, you tear up a little bit if you're an emotional person, like I am, you're just like uh, at these scenes and you're like, I'm watching a fucking anime. Like I thought, <laughs> I thought about that. I made that joke when I watched um, James Gunn's suicide squad, the, which I, I really liked his version. I really didn't like the first one, but the James Gunn one, I really dug. And there's I like, seen it. It's really good. There's I don't want to ruin okay. it for you, but there's a scene where uh, they're fighting yeah. a they're fighting a, a large uh animated starfish uh who you know and you're like and you're uh, there's a scene that's very emotional because it builds the whole movie builds up to it. And I'm like in tears watching someone fight a giant pink starfish. Like it's it's ridiculous, but but if the na- but if the human part is right, then the rest it doesn't matter. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah. What's what's next? That- for you what's coming up next uh so i'm, I'm doing a, uh my next middle grade graphic novel i'm, I'm writing it right now uh nice. thumbnailing it right now actually oh, uh it's right in front of me here on, this, on my <laughs> ipad uh and, and that one is going to be uh it's going to be about a great many things but uh basketball is, is kind of the uh cool. it's going to be about basketball nice. so i've always been a big fan of basketball and i um have a great enthusiasm for it and i would get picked because i'm I was like tall for a kid, like I'm like six feet. So I'm like, I'm just kind of, 
I'm like what was tall before, but now I'm just kind of like eh, you just you know, fell into <laughs> lowercase yeah, yeah. tall. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but I would get picked all the time for basketball as a kid because I was like tall, and I was just like always trying to um, manage expectations. Like, uh, hey guys, I know you just picked me, but like I'm not, you know, like oh no, yeah, this guy's modest. I'm like no, no, seriously. And then, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to help you here. Yeah, yeah. Out here. Just like I'll, I'll work the defense, I'll get the yeah. boards, you know this and that. Yeah. And uh, and then the game would kick off, and I'm like, dude, what are you doing? I was like, I told you, <laughs> I told you guys are not great. Anyway, so um, so I'm, I'm back to basketball, but doing it in a way that I can um, I could actually contribute <laughs> as a graphic novelist, not as a player. So. That's awesome. Well, is that uh, is is iPad your way to go? Is that how you generally do all your work now? nowadays swim team was the the very first way I, I had the giant drawing board and i had to draw it and i was working on bristol and um windsor newton series seven watercolor brushes and oh, and wow. um and india ink and the whole thing and but then with the with swim team i i thought well like if i can the advent of the ipad pro and clip studio paint mm-hmm. like uh got gets you like kind of like 85 percent of the way to the feel of paper Mm-hmm. And I thought uh, if I if I could find a way to do it and and make it look like I do traditionally, then I could open me up to like, you know, I could I can draw and work on a comic somewhere else. I can go mm-hmm. go to wherever, right? So also, uh, also time, like that's what I found about it. Like you save so much time. Like you're not having yeah. to scan and you know clean out pencils Raise. to do it all in one go. It's it's insane. Like, do you have that yeah, skin like the cover on the front to make it feel have the paper feel? No, but I, <laughs> I, I need to get that. I I had it in my uh, in. It's so funny. I had it like I was gonna buy it and then I totally forgot it. Um, oh really? Thanks. Yeah, for, I, I didn't do it either. But I've I've always been interested in it. I was curious how it was. Yeah, get that like a little bit of um, friction would be really good. Yeah, you know, ice skating on it. But it's, a, it's a lot better than it than the than I found my time on the Cintiq. That was a lot the kind of slippery. So yeah. I would sometimes just do thumbnails on a Cintiq, print those out, draw uh, like you know pencil and ink on top of that. Mm-hmm. But now I can just kind of do everything on on one one thing. I think uh, for maybe the one after the basketball, I might toy around with paper again because I do miss it. But we'll see. But this this is just so much faster, yeah. as you said. You know, and, you know. So you keep yeah. the process like very vertical, you know, from thumbs straight to inks, pretty, pretty. Closely. I made the pr- transition pretty fast after I did my first picture. I was like, this is insane. How uh, amazing, <laughs> you know, like I, I think I, I used um, um, procreate, but you know, the idea that okay. like doing all of it and then the layers are so easy and coloring underneath and shadowing and uh, it's insane. I watched, I think it was Adam Gorham uh, who worked. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. From Toronto. He was, he's been to the show. he, I was at a convention they do out in uh, Moncton called East Coast Comic Expo, uh, which, hey, if you ever uh, you need a connection to come out this way. Okay. Uh, it's a cool right one. On. It's, it's one that's very specifically comic book oriented. Um, Nick Bradshaw, who does a lot of work for Marvel, he, uh, mm-hmm. he lives in Moncton and he has something to do with it, sort of the way it's handled. But it's a really cool event that is really, because you do a lot of these conventions that they're like sci-fi and stuff and comics are kind of part of it. But this one is very yeah. much like comics are it. So it's it's really cool. Um, I love that. But I watched him working on, I think he was doing covers for his Ninja Turtle Stranger Things crossover or something. And uh, he was just coloring it on at his table when I was talking to him. And I was like, watching him finish this thing in like seconds. I'm like, oh my God, like I need to, I need wow. to get out of this. It was it really <laughs> opened my eye to how, you know, just a little brush and that little thing, a little color. And you just like every little nuance and you're like, oh man, like this, what am I doing? You know, scanning and yeah. all, all this stuff in Photoshop. Like, yeah, that's awesome. Cool. So you doing much conventions yeah. or anything around or? Uh, I'm doing, uh, since I've gone to the kids space, I, I do less conventions and I do more like book festivals nice. and kind of like library appearances, um, which, which makes more sense. And um, so it's been great. It's been great. So I'm, I'll be going to, I will be going to a convention. I'll be going to MICE in December, the Massachusetts Independent Comic nice. Expo in Boston. So I'll be doing that. I'll be going to the Miami Book Fair and september no not september september is gone it's the past yeah I have a time machine. um and uh in november and i'll also be going to um oh i don't think they've announced the other other thing i'm doing in november so no, no worries. so yeah so so i'll i'll be doing a few in december uh, november december coming up so excited about those that's cool return home to miami at least so do you still have family down there yeah Nice. Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah, I was just there. I think twice already this year. Oh, sure. So okay. uh, after, yeah, after swim team, I've had more kind of professional 
opportunities to go back, which is which is really cool to kind of first of all to be back, but then to be back there for the thing that you know I was doing and hiding on the bus so people wouldn't see my comics, yeah. and I'm coming back there specifically for <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah. It's kind of a blast, you know. Yeah, that's so, awesome. Um, yeah, yeah, very cool. Well, that's great. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, uh, Johnny. It was a, it was a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, likewise. Andre. Yeah, it's it's... Great meeting you, and thanks for having me on. Oh, no, I, I deeply appreciate it. I'll drop you a line when it's up. It should be on Monday. So, All right, yeah. Oh. Wow, that's fast. Yeah, yeah. You don't mess around, man. <laughs> Not usually. <laughs> I, every once in a while, you talk to people, but then uh, there's a little, there's little hiccup, like, you know, because I just put it the next one in the rotation. But every once in a while, there's like uh, like someone I had yesterday canceled, and then, you know, so it just works out that, uh, that you'd be next. So. Oh, fantastic. Awesome. I'll take it. Uh, well thanks again man have a great day all right my man thank you you have a good one too bye 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 Conversation with Johnny Christmas, a great chat, a great talk with a cool dude. And uh, you got some great projects coming down the line, so make sure to check those out. I will be promoting them on the social medias. But he did tell you where you could find all that sort of stuff while uh, while we we're talking. So check that out, get in on that. And uh, yeah, while you're at it, get ready for next week when we talk with uh, Stefan Petruccia, who is a very cool comic writer, who, uh, well, writer in general, not just comics, but he's written some novels, some books. Um, and uh, some comics, particularly the uh, the X-Files adaptation comics from Tops way back in the day. And also Power Rangers and some other works there. And then uh, he's branched out to his own thing and now he's on it again, doing a new novel. And uh, we chat about it. It's a great chat also with a great, cool, <laughs> great, cool, cool guy. And uh, yeah, looking forward to bringing that conversation to you as well. In the meantime, you know, get ready for Halloween. Get out, do some parties, eat some candy, do all that fun stuff. And I'll catch you in one week's time. The Graphic Histories Podcast is a proud partner of the United Federation of Podcasts. Yeah.